unless you have a purpose for them and if you have a purpose for them, then the fact becomes embodied because you either use it to change your perception or you use it to guide your actions and that's when it becomes meaningful and so you might say in part that a complex is the tendency of a group of associated ideas to manifest themselves in something approximating a personality and then that also gives you a real key to what the psychoanalysts were up to because as far as they're concerned you're just chock full of complexes and you know, you, you know, you think about yourself as one thing which is foolish because you know, you're obviously you're kind of like a loose collection of microorganisms, something like that and there's a certain amount of unity because you move the same way and there's, you know, there's continuity of memory but the representational space that you occupy you know, what you can do with your body and what you can imagine and what you can think is, is very, very large and it's not necessarily coherent or consistent and it switches from moment to moment you know, so you'll know that some of you undoubtedly have already experienced what it's like to be possessed by a particularly stupid idea you know, so maybe you've grown out of one or two of the stupid ideas that possessed you or maybe you're possessed by an attraction to someone you can't control or you can't control your eating behavior or you, you know, you're a pushover when it comes to interpersonal interactions because you're too agreeable or you fly off the handle and fight and, you know, none of this is really under your control and so all of those things that, that that manifest themselves, not only in your behaviors, but in your perceptions your perceptions themselves you know, they tend to take on embodied form and use you as the vehicle for their activity so, you know, and when you're thinking about something like anger, for example think about how it works, because it's quite peculiar um, what must someone generally do how must someone generally act if you're going to be angry at them? they have to be irritating, right? you know, they have to provoke you in some way well, the mere fact that you perceive what they're doing as irritating or provoking doesn't ensure that anyone else would have thought about it as irritating or provoking or that that's what they meant or that that's what's happening and my point is my point is it's very important to think about these complexes of ideas as subpersonalities because otherwise you really don't get what they're like if you're angry if you have a proclivity towards anger, especially if it's an unthinking proclivity anything that someone says might irritate you and it isn't like they say something and you think about it and then you get irritated it's like you perceive the person as irritating you know, maybe it's just the way they hold their mouth or something it, it, it can be very, very subtle and you might say, well, it's not me, it's you it's not that I'm irritated by you it's that you're irritating and that, you know, that's a very difficult thing to settle because the reality is somewhere between the subjective and the objective, right? a lot of arguments that you'll have with people throughout your life are about exactly that am I, are you irritating or am I oversensitive? it's like, well, you know, we're going to hash that out for a good long time before we figure it out but the point is, is that if you're possessed by an emotional state or a motivational state or an idea or some kind of complex you'll see the world through its eyes and then the facts reveal themselves to you through the lens of that particular set of ideas so it's a very frightening idea because, you know, we like to think of ourselves as masters of our own house which is completely clueless because it's obvious if you watch yourself for like a month that you hardly ever do what you tell yourself to do and you're liable to do all sorts of other things that you don't even want to do you know, because you say, well, I'm going to go to the gym three times a week and I'm not going to drink you know, and maybe there's this person I'm not going to associate with and then, you know, you don't go to the gym and you find that person and you go out and drink with them and you think, what the hell's going on, you know and, but it's, 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 you, you're not the sort of person that will do what you say and so, like, what sort of person are you? well, that's a psychoanalytic question it's a deep one because you're a peculiar thing and there's parts of you that are really, really, really old and, you know, the, the sort of naive you, the naive young you that you think of yourself as is like a little piece of flotsam in an ocean of complexity and the ocean of complexity is you and part of diving down into the depths is to start to understand what it means to be human and like whatever that means it's the one thing you can say about it for sure is that it's bloody peculiar so here's some associations of ideas that go along with these symbolic representations that I was describing so the feminine is often nature and here's some associations, they're not necessary associations they're common associations so if you see these sorts of things 
they would make a narrative sense so for example if you see an old um, and somewhat evil woman in a, an animated movie and she lives in a swamp that makes sense now why does it make sense? I can't explain that at the moment, but, well, it's partly because the swamp is outside of the standard bo borders of civilization, and it's also a place of death, decay, and rebirth, so that's part of it. Anyways, some associations. Nature the, is the unconscious. Why is the unconscious nature? Well, because you can't control it. It just manifests itself within you. That's the Freudian id. It's like dreams. They happen. You don't know what they mean. They just happen. And so that's nature operating inside of you. The terrors of the darkness. Why? Well, remember when you're a little kid, you're three, and you're afraid of the dark, because kids at three are afraid of the dark. What's in the dark? What are you looking for in your closet? Monsters, right. Where are the monsters? Well, they're not in your closet, hopefully. So, but that's not to say that there couldn't be a monster in your closet. And it's also not to say that when you look at your closet when you're a little kid that you're looking at your closet Maybe you're looking at the darkness And then the question of whether or not there are monsters in the darkness gets a lot more complicated I had a client once who was agoraphobic And she didn't like to take elevators, which is quite a common phenomena for people who are agoraphobic And so I was doing standard exposure, which is voluntary exposure to the unknown Which is a prime curative process in psychotherapy It's like Find out what you're afraid of that's interfering with your movement forward Break it into small pieces and expose yourself to it, that works So, we go to the elevator and, you know, I say, well, how close can you get to the elevator without being nervous? So she stands like ten feet away, I say, okay, well, stand there till you're bored and then go three steps forward So she could do that and, you know, made her a little nervous and then I said, well, stand there till you're bored And make sure you're looking at the elevator and not avoiding it and then take another three steps forward and, okay, we keep doing that until she's like at the elevator So then, I say, well, here's the deal um, We're just going to let the elevator doors open You don't have to get on, we'll let them close And then that's it for, for today You know, and I always tell people when I'm doing that sort of thing that I'm not going to trick them You know, there's no tricks, it's like you don't have to do anything you don't want to do And I'm not going to play any games on you, so Okay, so the doors open and she goes, that's a tomb and then it closes, and you think Well, was that an elevator or a tomb? And you might think, well, obviously it's an elevator It's like, things are not so obvious You know, because there are many ways of perceiving something And a given entity can be a member of multiple categories at the same time And you say, okay, well, yeah, the elevator's not a tomb But it's an enclosed, dark place that contains the unknown and when you see an elevator, you just see like a conveyance that moves you up and down, but that isn't what she saw And you might say, well, what she saw is wrong, it's like, not exactly, but it's not functional Right, it's not, if you want to take an elevator, then perceiving it as your tomb is probably inappropriate But the point is, is that it has a lot of associations, like, it, it's, it's a place of constriction and privation And isolation and separation, and so it has elements of there are elements of its being that overlap with other things that are frightening And so agoraphobics are often afraid too of being in a subway, being all crowded in a subway It's partly because they can't get out and make it to a hospital So enclosed places or crowd places are places where they encounter their mortality Because they get afraid they're going to die and then they can't get to the hospital